and welcome everybody who's on the line already. For you, those of you who don't know, my name is Daniel Medina with Investors Advantage Corporation. We are a financial planning and money management firm located in Westlake Village. Our, this company has been around and founded by John Grace in 1979. We're going to be doing these webinars every Wednesday for at least the next month to help you conquer the crash. Uh, today, John's going to be talking about uh, the stock market, what we're doing to prepare our clients, and we're going to have Jonathan Taylor on after that to talk about where this market's going. Next week, we're going to have Holly St. Germain. She'll be talking about the mortgage and real estate market, so tune in for that as well. All right, John. Thanks, Daniel. And yeah, folks, we're gonna we're just gonna continue doing these things because uh, we can. <laughs> and frankly, we see uh, right here. If you've been to our office, it's like command central for our peers. It's like all the financial advisors are really right on this block of Westlake and, and Mount Oaks Boulevard. It, it's it's so funny that we're all pretty well concentrated. But the funny, what's also interesting is to look at some of us, given what's been going on since about February March, with this uh, coronavirus situation. Uh, my peers, frankly, look like deer in the headlights. Uh, we are flat-footed. We are uh, hard-pressed to come up with something to say other than I'm sorry or, you know, that's just the way the market rolls. And part of the reason we're doing this is because uh, we're glad that we're not them, all right? And the reason we're not them principally is because we started paying for independent research in 1999, which really helped get a sense for how the economy works. And my, my best summary is to say, uh, and by the way, some years that was up to $10,000 a year. So, you know, I, I don't know how many people have paid for independent research, but when I'm writing that check, I'm reading every day, three o'clock in the afternoon, three o'clock in the morning, you know, coming from an organization that hasn't anything to sell and doesn't have an agenda. So uh, they're looking at the big picture and helping me understand what, what, what does that all mean. So it, it helps us uh, recognize, for example, that the, what, when people look at what's going on in the economy, they have a number of factors. And I'm going to say to you that the primary uh, driver is looking at the spending patterns of ordinary people first, affluent people second, and then the other piece of the puzzle is based on age. So, for example, you and I consume the most potato chips in life around age 14. And as a parent, you bought the most potato chips in life uh, when you were about 41 for your, on average, age 14-year-old. So it gets to be simple sometimes. It doesn't, doesn't have to be so convoluted and complicated. So we see that uh, stocks... Uh, uh, held higher today, uh, you know, after a, a batch of corporate earnings reviews, results topped the uh, expectations for the current coronavirus, and the Senate, of course, passed a deal to inject more fiscal stimulus into the economy. Uh, the Dow and the S&P were up about 1.7 percent, NASDAQ was up a little bit over 2 percent today, and who would have thought that, you know, Netflix would be, would be considered to be a defensive play, right? Who, who would have thought that? But these things, it's funny how things happen, and that's why we have to be agile because we never know what might disappoint us and what might surprise us to the upside. Uh, so another $484 billion was infused by the U.S. Senate uh, for its small business for aid program, coronavirus testing and hospital support package, with the House vote expected as soon as Thursday. And uh, uh, President Trump has suggested, you know, already will sign the bill as soon as it hits his desk. So investors are, con are continuing to closely watch the updates of energy markets as supply and demand concerns compounded with storage challenges for the physical commodity. The worst may be over for the U.S. economic stall stemming from the coronavirus, according to at least one, one economist. And this is good news. He, he suggests that this is uh, Neil Dutta, head of economics at Pantheon Macroeconomics, uh, says that the economy may have bottom. Um, now, that does not mean it's going to be a return to robust activity, but it does mean that economic conditions are not getting any worse at this particular time. He, he uh, notates, for example, that there appears to be an uptick in weekly steel product, production. The TSA travel numbers seem to have stabilized. Mortgage, mortgage purchase applications have ticked up, although I understand they're a little more harder to get even for the affluent. And people are starting to drive again. I mean, when's the last time your tank of gas lasted you a month or two? <laughs> Funny how these things happen. So what we're saying is we can't see the future. Uh, yeah, let's go to the next one, please. We're going to cover these items um, and get down to uh, the nitty gritty. We're, that's our introduction, looking at COVID already. We'll look at recommendations and what we think helps people keep their assets from getting crushed. And I'll give you the summary, really. It's active management. We'll explain that and greater diversification. So we'll, we'll talk about that as well, but that's our one-two punch. And as I say, we've been paid for independent research that helped us not only see the big picture,
but starting in 1999, the things that we can do, uh, and, and we began putting some of these uh, practices into place, like 2000, uh, our clients then in many cases were better prepared and held up better than, than so many uh, when you look at the market again in 2008. And then again, uh, third time would be fourth quarter 2018. So this isn't our first time to the rodeo and we're not flat footed. Uh, we have an agenda. We've been getting ready for something like this. We didn't know what it would be called. But again, that's a point that I like to make to people. When you're looking at what might happen, I'm saying to you, it's rarely the bus you see that could disrupt your day when you're jaywalking across the street. <laughs> it's typically the bus you didn't see, you did not time, and you could not foresee it's coming until it hits you, and hopefully you get up off the pavement and you're able to take down the license plate. So a couple of quotes that we like, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. And we do our, we are very fond of our, uh, our uh, trademark, the proof is in the planning. There's one more quote that I'm very fond of uh, because it really speaks to the profession as I see it. And that quote is from Colonel Patton. He said that uh, if everybody's thinking the same thing, then somebody isn't thinking, right? <laughs> so yes, Daniel, what's our the next one, please? Here's what we saw. This thing just came out of the blue. And unlike any other decline you've seen, this is about the fastest you've probably ever seen. Uh, and what you're seeing here is the peak, at least uh, so far for the year, looks to be around the 19th of February. Then we had a, uh, the outbreak, it, it became more public. It, it actually began, as you probably know, back in December, and I'm sorry, we were asleep at the switch. Uh, then we saw the massacre in oil prices, uh, the plummeting yields of US treasuries, uh, skyrocketing uh, interest rates declining on corporate level, uh, the expansive uh, Federal Reserve action the first time around, and then the CARES Act passes, but from peak to trough of uh, about 24%. Now, a lot of people, from what I can tell, not our clients, uh, their accounts were off more than that, and it really caused them uh, quite alarm. So what we're really talking about here is how can we keep your assets intact so that you can see what your number is and your threshold is within the degree that you are willing to accept to the plus and the minus, whatever that is, because if you're within that window, your personal threshold, you don't really care so much about what the market's doing as long as your assets are intact. That's the whole purpose of, uh, of the work we do. So that's what happened so quickly. And next one, please. Hello, Daniel. Here we go. Uh, this uh, gives you an idea of uh, where it happened. So we saw uh, transportation really taking it on the chin along with lodging restaurants. And, and then, you know, I love Paul Simon's uh, song, right? One man's ceiling is another man's floor. Uh, just like during the depression, which we should talk about, by the way, because who knows if there's another one in the cards, you notice that uh, a lot of people were buying a lot of beverages, adult beverages, I, I presume, much like the uh, Great Depression. And, and by the way, one of the things that came out of the Great Depression was uh, people increased their savings. I think that will be one of the, the, the pieces of uh, changes that we will uh, see happening at the consumer level. And this just gives you a sense for how long will this last. And this is really interesting compared to uh, like the pandemic of uh, 2018, or I'm sorry, 1918, right? Uh, we, we had a serious event back then, and it looks like it takes about 60 days for the peak to occur, and then we go through the decline. That, that, that might be the pattern, Although looking at that situation uh, back in 20 in 1918, I found that there were three peaks looking at it a little more closely. So I'm very concerned about, uh, you know, just as soon as we think we're getting out of the water, well, the sharks pull you back in. Uh, so we can't be overconfident. We just can't say that we beat this thing because, and understand part of the reason I say that is viruses have a way of going dormant like over the summer and they come back with a vengeance in the fall and the next winter. So uh, we don't want to be overly confident. This one's interesting. Uh, this is probably a, a week and a half uh, old now, and already it, it's already old. And, and what we're looking at here are uh, what has to happen for there to be a declaration that we're in a recession. And the only way you see that is in your rear view mirror. In other words, you have to have two negative quarters. Uh, right now we can see uh, with the uh, quarter two coming that we're in now, uh, as we get to the end of it, instead of being off 15%, it more looks like uh, 30. 
whatever the negative number is with two quarters in a row, that will put us uh, dead ahead in, in a recession. It's a word that you know some people are afraid to use. We were talking about the potential for a recession back in December. I, I pegged it at 20, 30%. In January, I thought the odds increased to about 80%. Right now, I, I think we're not going to miss this. It's going to be a 100% recession. And, and, and what will be different from some of the other ones that we've gone through is this one will be worldwide. No one is escaping this. And that's, that's my real concern about will it uh, lapse into a depression? That's what happened in 1929. It was a serious recession. And some suggest because of the tariffs at that particular time that caused the U.S. to slip into the Great uh, Depression. But again, remember, don't get depressed by that. If it happens, you want to be ready for it, okay? It's not, it's not the prediction that's important, it's the preparation. So uh, we're saying cash is king, and it means we need to have uh, buying and selling strategies to move out of positions at bad times and into cash, and then back into uh, risk assets during good times. For example, one, uh, one vehicle that we've been using for clients was 100% um, equities in November of 2019, at the beginning of November, but rotated 100% into US treasuries by the end of November. So the systems did the work that the buy and hold strategies just don't do because you own the shares and you're watching the price go down. Well, sometimes it makes sense to sell those shares, go into cash, and then have that cash ready to be de redeployed to enjoy the price going up. But you know, we can't, we can't stay in the, in the shares. We want to move out of risk assets into cash in a bad year and then back into risk assets as the upward mobility is happening and we can enjoy the melt up. So we're saying you want to be more diversified than you've ever been before. People uh, bring us statements and go, well, we're pretty diversified. Look, we have 18 different positions. And typically they're a combination of exchange traded funds and mutual funds. And I just need you to know, I don't care what combination you bring us, 18 position. It's cash, bond, stocks. That's it. You can look at a thousand different fund names. It's some combination of cash, bonds, and stocks. That's as many as three legs, okay? When we look at the institutions and the endowments and the foundations, Yale as an example we've talked about before, we see seven or eight different legs underneath their portfolio stool. So, you know, we don't need to maybe understand them all enough, and I'm not saying that that's what you should do, but what I am saying is we can agree, you know, six, seven, eight legs underneath your life savings is certainly a stronger stool than two or three legs. That's the point. The second point is when you are looking at a decline here, let's say at US equities, for example, you may find that there's a gain there. You fill in that blank. But we have to be there early so that that gain may be able to offset the loss or at least abate some of that loss as opposed to watching just the loss. Do real planning. Don't just throw darts and feel good when the account goes up or bad when the account goes down. We want folks to understand one, uh, how much loss can you accept? We think that is very important. Typically, it's not a question that is asked or answered by investors. And then two, how'd your portfolio do last time? Because maybe it's going to do the same thing next time as it did last time or, or something very close to that. And how might we be better prepared the, the next time around? Uh, and then have the strategies in place. What am I buying? Why? And what am I selling? Under what conditions? We need to know that. I don't care what you're buying. You need to know when you're selling it or what the conditions are under which you will sell. Because so many times get to the, people get to the peak and they don't see the trough right around the corner. And of course, they, they have regret. Active management, simply put, Jonathan will explain this in much greater detail, but just to kind of paint the picture for you. Remember the movie Karate Kid, Wax On, Wax Off? So, you know, it's either all in or all out, just to make it very simple. So in 2008, when the market was uh, finishing the year off about 37%, you wanted some kind of a strategy in place, not that you had to do it, nor us, but we hired the teams to do this work on our behalf. So no matter what's going on in life or how busy you might be, how things have changed throughout the year, as the markets are declining, you see your asset base of cash, say going from two or 5% to maybe 50 or 60 or 70%, something like that moving risk off the table in 2008. And then starting around March 9, when we see the melt up occurring in a very big way, uh, March 9, 2009, now we want to move back, you know, we risk off in 08, we risk on. So wax off in 08, wax on 100% in 2009. That combination, the evidence is, you know, uh, we had clients that were off maybe 20% or no, certainly no more than 20% in 2008 because the, the accounts moved to cash. 
And then in 2009, we moved out of money market accounts into risky assets like bonds and stocks. And with that combination, if you limited your loss to 20% of the bad year, 2008, when the market's off 37%, and many mutual funds and ETFs were off 41, 42%, and then you got a gain of 25 or percent or better net in 2009, you have more money, 12, 31, 2009, than you did 1, 108, and many of the more passive accounts of mutual funds and exchange traded funds took maybe three, four, five years or near that to get back to even as opposed to the actively managed accounts that were back to even in about uh, 24 months or so. So unlike our peers, we're not caught in the, in the headlights. Uh, we're, we're calling people, we're meeting with them, we're helping them see how their account is doing relative to the market and making sure that they recognize their number, that's the one we want you to focus on. Because as I say, if you're within that range of your number, you can let go of what the market's doing. You want all the upside, but you of course want to limit all of the, as much of the downside as you possibly can. And, and review real risk tolerance. We working with a couple just yesterday. We asked them, uh, we're going to show you, there's a little video we have, we'll send this afterwards, along with the questionnaire that we're going to ask you to complete, because it asks you to discover, it's not are you conservative, moderate, or aggressive, the better question is how much loss can you accept? So there's a series of questions and you answer those and it gets you to a number. And it may be, you know, with this one couple, uh, he said that he was willing to accept a 50% loss. And I said, well, I'll challenge you on that in two ways. One, does your wife know what you're thinking? And two, uh, let's talk about an L-shaped recovery. I'll come back to that. So if, uh, when, when he sat down with the questions with his wife, guess what? The correct answer for the family became, no, 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 we can't try and do that again, 50%. How about 5%? Let's do that. I can sleep with that. I'm not, after the gains, uh, because we've done pretty well for ourselves, but uh, we're not trying to make this account double or triple. We're trying to limit the losses. And I would feel upset if, uh, you know, the loss was more than 5%. Then we go back to see how the current portfolio did. The next step is to see how a proposed portfolio might do. So let's talk real quick about, you know, is this going to be a V-shaped recovery? That's what we all want, okay? But I don't believe hope is a strategy. So what I'm saying, in fact, I was just on a program uh, today uh, with uh, TD Ameritrade saying, you know what? We've got to think of this. Hopefully it's V-shaped. Let's suppose it's W. Let's suppose it's U. Let's suppose it's L-shaped. L-shaped, yeah. So we've been here a couple of times. With the U.S., it took uh, 25 years for stocks to come back after the Great Depression. By some accounts, four decades for New York real estate to come back after the Depression. More recently in Japan, we saw that uh, markets peaked around, actually like New Year's Eve, 1989, both for stocks and real estate. Stocks uh, declined by 80%. Real estate, I believe, in Japan declined by 70%. So the trick question I like to ask is, uh, which one has come back first? So people choose, and I like to say, well, remember I said it was a, a trick question because the correct answer is D, none of the above. So can you imagine being in a position stocks and real estate 30 years later and you're still not back to where you were 30 years ago. Could that happen again? I think it could. So on that note, what you see here is a, a part of a, a piece of work that I did for my colleagues around uh, two years ago. And uh, what I asked was uh, my colleagues, about 100 of us it's in Woodland Hills, I said, how do you think this house was left standing? And the two answers I got was act of God, and divine intervention. And I said, wow, okay, we have some faithful in here. God bless you all. Those aren't the correct answers. <laughs> the correct answer is it was built to last. In other words, this was a, a young man and uh, his doctor figured out which one is which, but it was two relatives. And they wanted to build this house in Mexico Beach, Florida. But what they said was we need to find, you know, the guy who can, our gal, we need a team of people who are going to build this thing to last. And by that, they made some a structure out of what they thought last meant. We want it to, to last through 250 mile per hour hurricane winds, really. So they go to the contractor and the contractor says, well, I've never done that before, but I like the assignment. So here's what we're gonna need to do. First, we're gonna have to put pylons, pilings in the ground, not 10 feet, not 20 feet. Let's go down 40 feet. Let's put rebar in the walls because we want this thing to withstand whatever the winds might be. And so they went through a number of items on the list to make sure that they weren't doing something mediocre or average or just to government standards. No, we want to, he, the, 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 I think it was a, a neurologist, uh, lives uh, officially in, uh, in Tennessee. And they put a camera on the house and he could see the, the, the roof flapping like, you know, 
a bird flying in the air. He thought for sure the roof was going to take off any minute. Clearly, the, the, the roof withstood the winds, so they felt successful. Uh, and, and we use this as an analogy to say, look at all the devastation elsewhere. We want to build portfolios for you that will last no matter what happens as best we possibly can. But it means that we have to ask better questions and look to see if we can put together better structures so that, that indeed the structure that you've constructed will survive whatever might just happen that you never expected to happen. Okay, so uh, we like to say that most investors, uh, unfortunately, were not prepared for the last two months in terms of what's been going on, caught them by surprise. And if that's the case, you may not be prepared, be prepared for the next 20 years. So we want to learn from the past as opposed to repeat it and be prepared for the next 20 years in the event there's another COVID-19 that's just uh, in, the, in the works and it hasn't showed up its ugly head yet. So to speak on that issue, we have uh, Jonathan Taylor just waiting patiently and I'm so delighted he's here today because uh, he, ha he works, uh, he's a certified, I'm sorry, a certified financial analyst, CFA. Uh, he's been with Rockdale for about a year or so. But what I really appreciate about Jonathan's background is that he comes from the wirehouses, like Merrill Lynch for about 14 years, if I'm not mistaken. And the reason that's important to me is because what we see and he can speak to is when it comes to the big name companies, they're all doing the same thing. They have portfolio models and you, they pick one for you and then tell you to buy and hold, hold and hope and sit and take it. And some of us have issues with that, and I think that's for good reason. So, uh, Jonathan, take it from here and, and show us what Rockdale does and the particulars with, uh, with the uh, you know, active management, and then also show us how you have a perspective, but the speedometers help drive the decisions so that you're looking at clients' accounts daily, asking the question, is it risk on or risk off? Did we lose Jonathan? Jonathan, your mic's on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. There we go. All right, perfect. Um, so thank you, uh, John and, and Daniel, for in, inviting me today. And I'm going to echo a lot of uh, uh, John's comments around the state of the world at the moment, where we are, what our outlook is. It's nice to hear that our view of, of the world is aligned with yours, uh, and uh, we'll spend some time going through that. Um, I just want to confirm again, just make sure everybody can see the screen uh, and or the presentation on the screen that says the sun rises in, in the west. Is that correct? You're good. Just yes. give me a thumbs up. Okay, perfect. Thank yeah. you. And, and um, one more, I'm sorry, Jonathan, but Daniel, give us instructions no, for uh, questions so that we can kind of set those up so that when we get done, we've got a Q&A period, please. In your menu bar, there is a Q&A portion. You can put a question in there. It'll come directly to me. Thank you. And we'll ask it towards the end. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks again to John and Daniel for inviting me to speak today. Uh, and more importantly, thanks to uh, all of you who have joined this Zoom call uh, to spend some time or take some time out of your busy day uh, to, to hear about our story and, and to hear what our market outlook is. Uh, however, if you're like me, being stuck at home with two kids under five, this is a blessing to be able to step away for an hour or so from, from the chaos that's sort of surrounding us at all times. Um, and, and, and I do appreciate you joining us. So uh, let me jump in. I'm going to spend about 30 minutes today on, on the call. Uh, first, I, I'm going to address uh, the sort of conversation from the angle of who is City National Rockdale uh, and what do we do or, or, or what do we distinguish ourselves on uh, when we work with clients uh, like like many of you on the phone uh, and then the second um, and so that'll go for about 10 minutes and then the second uh, half of this uh, conversation will steer toward the presentation that you see on your screen now uh, which will go through our uh, outlook in our market commentary and or very specifically portfolio action uh, that we're taking on behalf of our clients. Um, so let me start with first uh, who we are um, and what distinguishes City National Rockdale. So uh, City National Rockdale is a boutique investment management firm. We were founded in 1986 
And we set out at that time with really one unique goal. And that goal was to create a personalized investment portfolio that matched the needs and goals of our clients, right? Uh, 30 years ago, that was somewhat revolutionary. Uh, nowadays, that uh, planning aspect, the financial plan uh, leads the way, which is a good thing. This is what we wanted. Uh, but our 30 years and our being in the business uh, for the last 30 years, we've gotten really good at, at, at doing just that. Right. Currently, we, we manage around $40 billion in assets for, for our clients. And all of that partnership, all of the assets that, that, that we manage has come through the direct partnership with independent fin financial advisors like John and, and, and Daniel. We do not take client money directly. Uh, we only work with high net worth and individuals and or families. In addition uh, to keeping your investment plan coordinated with your financial plan, Rockdale has uh, set out to distinguish ourselves in, in really three main areas, and I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about these. The first is tax management. The second is income management, and the third is risk management. Now, in our 30 years, we've gotten good at doing these three things along with keeping that financial plan matching the investment plan. And we've done this, and we've developed this strategy at the request of our clients. And so I'll spend a minute talking a little bit about uh, tax management, income management, and, and or risk management. Um, but in interest of time, I'm not gonna be able to spend the amount of time I would like to on each of those. If you have interest in learning more and or hearing more about what we do and how we do it for, for clients, please let myself, John, or Daniel know, uh, and we will happily set up a call after this uh, to dive in deeper. But from a tax management standpoint, we do two things well. First, we work with clients and their existing port portfolios to transition and to come up with what we call a transition plan and in a tax efficient way. And what I mean by that is typically with us through a series of phone calls and or meetings, we will analyze your current portfolio. We will review it we will make suggestions, and then we will come up with a plan and or a tax plan if uh, that is part of your current circumstances <clears throat> to transition your existing portfolio and or make, in, uh, make suggestions and or improvements upon your current portfolio uh, to get aligned with our view and our thinking of the world at, at, at that time. And so we do that by keeping positions in kind, we work to tax loss harvest, uh, and then we work to uh, mitigate the, uh, the implications and or complications by, by helping create a tax budget with you over a series of a year, two years, three years, depending on your, your current tax situation. In addition to that, I mentioned this a second ago with respect to uh, this idea around tax loss harvesting. And so on an ongoing basis, uh, we will work to tax loss harvest your existing portfolio on an annual basis. And, and, and what I mean by that is, is at any given time, um, you, if, if you have a security that, that, that you buy for a dollar and that security over a year goes up to $10 per share and you sell it, the government requires you to pay taxes on that $9 capital gain. Well, what the government also does is at any time during the year, if you bought a security for $10 and it goes down to $1 per share, you can take that $9 loss and offset that $9 gain. And so what we've done for our clients, knowing that uh, we own roughly 70 to 100-ish individual stocks for our clients, there's volatility in the market. Not every security, unfortunately, goes up from day one. Uh, and or the beginning of the start of the year. And so there's volatile periods where we use those as opportunities to tax harvest and to, or, and to set out um, a, a plan to minimize uh, taxable consequences with respect to your individual portfolio. And I'll talk a little bit about how we do that. Uh, the second area I mentioned was income. And so what we do here is we specifically divide, uh, design portfolios to meet the needs or to meet the income needs of our clients, plain and simple. If you came to me and said, Jonathan, 
I need $50,000 a year. I need $100,000 a year. Uh, I am, you know, transitioning into a retired period of my life, uh, and I'm no longer going to have the level of income from my job. Uh, we will work to create a portfolio that meets those needs. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you if those needs and goals are realistic. If that $50,000 a year, that $100,000 a year is realistic, given uh, your risk tolerances and or your appetite and your willingness to accept risk. In addition to that, uh, we will then create a portfolio that specifically targets that income need. The third area I mentioned was risk management. The risk management area, unfortunately, can be a uh, very detailed and long conversation. I will keep it brief by saying we believe uh, in allowing ourselves to listen to what the economy and the financial markets are, are telling us. And we like to be flexible in our asset allocation approach based off of what we view at that time is likely to occur over the next three, six, 12, 24 months. This is what John mentioned earlier when he was talking about our, our speedometers. Our speedometers drive uh, our uh, forward-looking and or near-term asset allocation, and that allows our portfolio managers the flexibility to move in and out of asset classes. So think stocks and bonds, but also think uh, very specifically areas like international stocks. So for the last year and a half, we have not invested in our client portfolios in international developed stocks, things in Europe and Japan. In addition to that, we haven't invested in small or mid cap companies here in the United States for a variety of different reasons. But our view is if we can get your financial plan and your investment plan in lockstep, and then we allow ourselves to be flexible based off of what is going on in the economy at any given time, that's a huge step in our view of reducing and or eliminating risk for most investors. Okay. Um, when you think about what Rockdale offers uh, in terms of our intelligent personalized por portfolios, we do that uh, mostly through the use of individual stocks and bonds. Uh, each position allows our portfolio managers the ability to build and or to use those as the building blocks in your portfolio to create that foundation to meet your goals and needs. I really liked John's example of the house in Florida on, on the beach, and I am going to borrow that, but that's correct. If you have the structure in place, if you have the foundation, the right foundation in place, you're able to potentially weather the storm and allow for, again, your financial plan to match your investment plan. The biggest risk outside of yourself that most investors face is getting your, in, your investment plan and or your portfolio relative to your investment plan deviating from your financial plan. And so our portfolio managers and the ability to use our portfolio managers and, and work directly with them ensure that that process starts off on the right path and continues on the right path uh, and allows us to course correct as the economy tells us to course correct and allows us to course correct depending on your goals and your needs and your changing um, circumstances. So when you think um, in, in terms of uh, what really sets us apart and, and what distinguishes us um, from uh, our competition and or other uh, asset managers or other investment managers. Um, it, it starts with the uh, ability for every one of our clients to get direct access to a portfolio manager. Uh, these, por these portfolio managers are responsible for managing the day-to-day -day investments of their client portfolios. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, they will course correct as the economy dictates and they will change into a course correct depending on your needs. But these are folks that are going to be available to you to have conversations, to have reviews, to help understand what our view is at any given time and why that's important. I've done a series of calls very much like this one with our portfolio managers for our clients where we've gotten on and we've explained to someone that is nervous 
and said, here's our view, here's how you're invested relative to that view, and here's what we think is likely to happen going forward. And I will explain a little bit more later in the presentation about our, our current positioning. Uh, but for example, over the last three to four weeks, we've raised about 20 to 30% in cash across all of our client por portfolios. And so in, in doing that, we reached out to our advisors like John and Daniel, and they reached out or we reached out together with our portfolio managers to have a conversation with clients to help them understand why we were doing that and then what sort of areas we were looking forward uh, to get clients back. What, what was our plan to get clients back invested to uh, their long-term uh, allocations? Uh, two more points and then we'll jump into uh, the economic portion of the presentation today. Uh, so when you look at Rockdale, we have 300 plus individuals and our investment professionals helping steer this ship. Um, all of our portfolio managers and our, uh, our senior investment consultants, which is the role that I am in, uh, have either an MBA or a CFA. John mentioned this earlier, the Chartered Financial Analyst designation and or an MBA. Um, and that really sets us apart, right? So that, that gives us the experience, that gives us the expertise, and that gives us the knowledge base to have intelligent conversations with you uh, and or dive in deep and or create portfolios that uh, are meeting your goals and or your individual needs. Um, the last thing I will discuss, again, before we jump into the economy, into the economic portion, uh, you may be sitting there saying, okay, so how does it work in terms of uh, you know, John and Daniel, as well as Jonathan and City National Rockdale. So the analogy that I like to give is, is think of John and Daniel as your captain of your ship, right? Rockdale is here to help in a couple of different ways. We're, we're here in a lot of cases to help design the ship, help you build the ship, help you make sure there's enough fuel up for the ship, map out your trajectory. And then once you set up on that course, we're the crew that's on the boat with you, making sure that you are staying on path, staying on trajectory, and that ultimately you're meeting your destination. Right? A little cheesy, get it, but I think it sets out how this dynamic works uh, between our firm as well as uh, John and Daniel. Okay, I will stop there. Um, uh, Daniel mentioned earlier about questions uh, if you have any questions about who our firm is and, and sort of what we do, happy to take those here in a few minutes. Um, but let me switch gears a little bit uh, getting into the economy. Um, when you look at the uh, economy and we start to dive into what's going on currently, uh, I always feel it, it's, um, it, it, it's a good place to start by adding a little context and, and sort of reviewing last year and or reviewing what our view was coming into this year. Uh, and so I'll take a minute or two to just talk a little bit about that, and then we'll jump into our current view, what's going on with the coronavirus, what we're seeing in the market, and then the actions that we're taking on behalf of our clients. Uh, so when you think about last year, it seems like it was forever ago, but last year, all asset classes, again, think stocks and bonds across the board, uh, finished largely positive. The S&P 500, for example, uh, U.S. large cap stocks were up roughly 30%. Uh, and, and it was sort of a, an, an anomaly where all asset classes were up. It was a fantastic year, so to speak, across the board uh, from a performance standpoint. Um, our view coming into 2020 centered around the idea that the economy was in the later stages of its current uh, financial market and or economic cycle. And that we felt valuations were extended and or getting extended. So what we came into the year was positioning our, our clients in portfolios that had increasing levels in uh, quality assets. And what I mean by that is we reduced our international developed exposure I mentioned earlier. We reduced and or eliminated our, our mid and small cap exposure. And we moved to an overall more defensive position right, on the equity side as well as the fixed income side. So on the equity side, we, we wanted to own um, really high quality, uh, solid balance sheet comp type companies 
uh, less out there on the you know the price to earnings and growth spectrum, uh, less out there on the deep value type of uh, stocks. We wanted to own a broad basket of core stock industries uh, that we felt were very high quality and were uh, in a lot of cases paying a dividend um, and had the cash flow to continue to do that. On the fixed income side, uh, depending on your risk tolerances and your needs, generally speaking, uh, we were um, higher quality within each of the different asset classes. I think even within high yield, uh, we weren't owning the lowest grade junk bonds. We were owning higher quality, high yield. Uh, we, had, we had spent, uh, and our uh, firm had spent a lot of time doing research on individual securities to own within the space. We had started to move more into investment grade corporate uh, debt. Um, and on the muni side, we had done a lot of research. Our team had done a lot of research, understanding which, which municipalities uh, were uh, financially sound, so to speak. Um, now, we, we, we couldn't, and it'd be disingenuous for me to sit here and say that we could foresee any of the current state and situation that we're in now, uh, but we did come into the year uh, moving to a more higher quality position and a more defensive position. Okay. When we start to look uh, at uh, what I'm going to spend the rest of my time uh, today speaking about, first, we'll start with a little bit of sort of what is the market outlook, what's some recent activity that's been happening, uh, then we'll move into uh, what's the current situation and, and what, what we're monitoring with respect to uh, COVID-19 and what our outlook is here. Uh, the impacts that that's having on the broader economy, as well as what policy responses uh, have um, been enacted from the Fed, uh, as, as well as Congress. Um, and then we'll end with our sort of path forward, as, as well as our sort of portfolio positioning. Let me jump into this slide. So when you... Um, when, when you think about what has been happening, uh, and, and uh, let me start with respect to, you know, what's, going, what's been going on in the market. And, and so a couple of things that have started to be positive news and news that we're following uh, is the social distancing. So since we have up here in New York, hospitalization rates have, have, have peaked, but, but broadly speaking, the, the, the social distancing in the United States and around the world uh, seem, seems to be working, right? We, we are flattening the curve and we're uh, um, as sort of becoming in our lexicon now, this idea of flattening the curve. But we have started to see pockets of success uh, across the United States and across the globe. Major cities have, have taken action in terms of these stay-at-home orders, uh, and, and these actions have started to bend the curve, so to speak. Uh, and, and this is really going to be key uh, to getting us all uh, back to work and or getting the virus under control so that we can all ultimately get back to work. And, and, and so that's been positive. Um, what we've also seen over the last few weeks, and John mentioned this, there was another bill signed last night for you know three, four hundred billion dollars for small businesses. Uh, but the Fed has taken sort of unprecedented steps uh, to launch programs that will uh, provide liquidity, uh, from a lending perspective to small businesses and or and um, broader municipalities. Again, this is a very positive development that is going on and likely to continue in different phases as, as, as we move forward. Um, the policymakers, so to speak, uh, governments and or um, companies around the United States are, are starting to uh, talk and or create their plans around the idea of reopening. And this is really key, right? This is a positive uh, state. This has to be done correctly. Um, unfortunately, there will likely be situations in companies and states and or cities where they're able to go back to work in some capacity. And we'll talk a little bit about what we think that's going to look like here in a few minutes. Um, but states like California are, are already sort of regionally developing a plan uh, with other states on how that's going to look, how that's going to work, how they're going to coordinate their efforts um, so that we don't have a major outbreak and a restart of the outbreak, again, that we're currently facing. Um, in addition to that, over the last week, week and a half, uh, we, we've got some positive developments 
um, in, in terms of uh, treatments as, as well as vaccinations. Uh, there's some trials that have shown positive results. Some of these vaccinations, uh, some of the trials associated with those are starting up this weekend during the next few weeks, again, which is a positive step. Unfortunately, we still think it's likely a situation where we don't get a full vaccination and a full 100% treatable plan and or multiple treatments because uh, not everyone is going to respond uh, to, to every single treatment the same until next year. Uh, but if we can continue to social distance, if we can continue uh, to put uh, the right measures in, in place, uh, it, it will help us in terms of restarting the economy and door opening uh, back up the world from a from from an economic standpoint. Um, last uh, week and over the last few weeks, the S and P 500, uh, not including this week, has has been up about 15 percent. That 12 percent was really actually two weeks ago, and then last week we were up an, another three percent. So so we've been up about 15 percent, um, and uh, we've been up about 28 percent since the bottom. Uh, and it, it may not feel like that, um, but we do feel uh, that that's likely uh, to be um, that's likely to hit a pause. Uh, we're, we're 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 likely to continue positive news, but we're also likely to have uh, some retracements and some some bad economic data here coming in the next few weeks, the next few months. Um, let me jump forward here. So peeking back a little bit about how we got here, and I'll try to keep this brief because John did a great job of kind of explaining this, but this started in February uh, with this sort of outbreak and or that coming to fruition uh, with everybody really focusing on it. Um, and then in early March, we, we, we had this oil price war that started between the Russians and the Saudis, uh, neither wanting to really cut supply. And, and uh, so we've seen, we've all seen the news hopefully in the last day or two where oil prices have gone negative uh, and or oil futures have gone negative. What, what has happened here is that, um, you know, in March we woke up one Monday and oil prices dropped 34% one day. Uh, this is unprecedented uh, and it, this caused uh, an additional leg down in the overall market. This had and uh, was having a material effect in the fixed income markets, as well as you know the broader economy, uh, when you think in terms of high yield debt and or high yield bonds, the energy space uh, made up of about 15% of all issuances. And so, when you at at the time in, in March when you had oil trading down at $20 a barrel, and now it's even worse, you're in a situation where it's it's real conversations around the economic viability of in some energy companies and which ones are going to uh, um, be with us here in the near future and which ones may have to file for bankruptcy. Now, what has happened is that spilled over where you see the corporate interest rates skyrocket. Uh, that spilled over into other parts of the market. There were some municipal bond situations as well as some investment grades. So, so higher quality corporate debt, where the market for a very brief period of time uh, started to have some liquidity issues and started to have um, major discounts, 20%, uh, in some cases, more discounts on positions two, three weeks ago that, that were trading nowhere near those levels. And so luckily, the Fed has really stepped in here, uh, which, is a, which is a huge positive uh, with uh, a few of their liquidity features, one being Main Street lending, uh, another one was the municipal liquidity facility, and they've added about a trillion dollars of liquidity to the system, and this is functioning now. This is starting to get liquidity back into the market. Um, we, we, we had the CARES Act again, which was very positive. This was the step to get money back into uh, you know, small businesses. Um, and so, we, we've seen this bounce off the lows. The, the, the market um, dropped about 34%. And since then, we've rebounded off those lows uh, roughly to about 16%. Um, what, what I do want to say is we do want to caution here. If you look historically, uh, and you can see on this slide, um, we, we've highlighted past bear markets, uh, and, and those being uh, 1973 and uh, 
and, and 74, the 2000s, 2002, and 2007 to 2009, each of those had pretty significant peak to trough declines. Um, from that uh, trough, there were rallies of roughly 8 to 21 percent. The important part of me highlighting this is that far right column where it says rally peak to market bottom, we're, we're likely to see a scenario where we do have a pullback from here. Now, and those past recessions, they were all down, again, closer to 30%. I'm not standing here and saying the market is going to pull back another 30 40% from our, our current levels, but I'm setting the expectation for you uh, and, and keeping this that uh, top of mind that we're likely to see um, in the future and or for the foreseeable future additional volatility. And I'm, and I'm framing it that way because that's part of the thesis that we have in terms of raising cash for our, our clients uh, and or keeping cash at, at levels uh, roughly 20 to 30 percent across the board. So one of the things um, John mentioned earlier was our speedometers, right? We update the, these on a, on a monthly basis and, and, and they're really helpful to provide clients and or prospective clients an, an understanding of our view of what's going on in the economy at any time. Uh, we can share them with you after this call. We're happy to send them out uh, and happy to sign you up if you'd like to get our sort of economic thinking with our speedometers on a monthly basis. Um, but I could put it across the room. They're nice, pretty colors, red, yellow, and green. And you could look just by looking at this, or you could get a sense just by looking at this, how our view and, and, and what we're seeing and what our view is over the next three, six, 12 months. Um, with respect to uh, the current market environment, we've added some indicators in there as this coronavirus is what is prevalent. This is what's causing this global halt in our economy. And so, the good thing is we've had some positive positive developments over the last week or two. Uh, now, there's there's a lot of folks on this call. Um, many of you are uh, highly influential in your communities, and this is a personal note to all of you. As much as you can get people uh, who, within your circle of influence to encourage testing and get more testing around the United States, this is going to be our path forward. Um, if, if we don't get readily available testing and or the speed and or accuracy of that testing, uh, we need testing to have results within 24 hours, if not sooner, if not an hour or, or two. And until we get that point, uh, we're going to have a slower economic growth. We're going to have a slower economic uh, cycle. Many of us are still going to be continuing to work from home. But as you can see, I won't go through each of these, but as you can see, um, it, you know, the mortality rates, the spread, as well as policy responses uh, from the Fed and government have been uh, extremely positive. Um, I'm going to skip the next few slides in interest of time, because uh, a lot of that, if you've watched the news or you've read a newspaper over the last a uh, month or two, a, a lot of it is uh, regurgitation of that. But I do want to stop here. I just mentioned testing. So what do we need to do to get back to normal? Again, the number one thing is we have to get better testing. It has to become more readily available. And we have to do that because we have to be able to identify and or isolate cases where we are and or will in the future have an outbreak and or have sort of these flare ups as they call them. Um, and, and that can be done in a uh, digital way where we'll be able to identify regions and or cities and or streets in some cases where there has been an outbreak and there has been a flare up uh, so that uh, we can keep folks isolated and or quarantined, so to speak. Um, we get this data and, and we get the next few slides actually from uh, Kinsey, who is providing a lot of this commentary. Uh, directly to New York City. Um, but what we're thinking and what we're feeling is the return to normalcy is going to come in a variety of different phases. And this is going to feel and look different for different parts of the economy, for different industries, as well as different parts of the population. Uh, those that are at high risk are really going to be um, in, in some aspects stuck in place. They're going to be in the locations that they are until we get uh, much lower numbers from from a from a um, 
uh, from a spread standpoint and or an infection standpoint. And until we get really definable treatments in, in place, you're going to see those high risk populations really stuck in their uh, current situations. Um, the reason we highlight this is uh, there's going to be different industries, there's going to be different parts of the economy that um, are, are, are going to be ripe for in, investing based off of which parts of the economy are less likely to be infected or, or excuse me, Im impacted and or more likely to benefit in some aspect uh, from this future new normal or future state. Uh, it's early to necessarily decide exactly how that's going to all play out, but we're monitoring a lot of things associated with that and what that phase uh, rollout in, in terms of uh, many of us getting back to work. Um, it, it's funny, I, I just got an email um, last week from my company saying when you're in common areas, uh, you need to wear a face mask or some sort of face covering. So that's the elevator, that's the lobby, uh, that's when you're you know, going to the break room or whatnot. The funny part in this story, um, and, and I like to keep humor even in times like these, is that uh, I, the building I work at, the first floor, is a bank. Uh, so what's funny is that I am going to be walking into a bank wearing a face mask, and I think historically that's not something that would have been looked at too, too positively, uh, but there's going to be you know, this influx of people, even banking, that are going to be coming in with face masks on and hiding their faces. I just kind of find that a little humorous at the moment. Um, so let's, let's jump forward in, in terms of what's happening in, in the economy uh, and some of the headline things, uh, and we should wrap this up here in the next five or six minutes uh, from my perspective, and then we'll be happy to take any of your questions. Uh, unemployment, uh, it's been an unprecedented level of, of, of unemployment. Uh, we'll get new unemployment numbers here soon, um, but we've had 22 million folks so far file for unemployment. This is unprecedented and really unsustainable. Uh, we're probably going to end up and, and we're coming up upon uh, the U.S. unemployment rate being close to 15 to 20 uh, percent, and, and that's likely to happen. I'm po what, what they're pointing out on this slide here is that typically, uh, it, it, from a historical per perspective, it's taken from a uh, job perspective about 50 months to recover the lost jobs. Now, we were at historic uh, employment levels, meaning close to 4%. We're not likely to get back in all of those jobs and be back to 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 four percent unemployment here anytime in the near future. But we don't think it's going to take fifty months to get back to a normal level of employment and recover many of these lost jobs. We think it will likely be uh, much closer to twenty four months uh, from this sort of bottoming process. Um, and and the reason we highlight this is, uh, moving into sort of what we see as our likely path forward um, for growth as, as well as the broader economy and our global economy uh, in some part. And what I mean by that is the main point I, I would like for each of you to take away from today is that we do feel this is going to be a shorter recession. It will be deep. It will be very painful. Unfortunately, there will be not only losses of life because of the coronavirus, there's going to be losses of jobs and people that are permanently uh, impacted by this. Um, and the future of what the United States economy is going to look like will take you know, five to 10 years to really filter itself out as that's happened with past recessions. Where I'm headed with that is we do feel that this is likely to be much shorter uh, than, um, you, you know, past recessions, and we are likely to get something similar. We're slightly different from what John described earlier in terms of an L-shaped recovery. We're likely to be much more of a Nike check or a Nike swoosh. So we do think it's going to be deep, but it will be short, uh, and uh, we, we will start to see recovery ahead. Uh, it's, you're going to hear a lot of bad news from the headlines and from the media, not all of the news across the board is going to actually be bad. Consumers in a broad sense have changed their appetite. Uh, there, there are industries, travel and entertainment that will be affected for a very long period of time, really until we get a vaccination. Um, but there are positives, there are industries uh, that are set up well uh, 
uh, to take part in that recovery and take part in that rebound that we're likely to see here um, coming into beginning middle of next year. When we look at GDP, and this is one of the last comments I will have until we get into portfolio action, and that um, will be a few comments and I'll open it up for questions. But when we look at GDP, we're likely to have um, very severe pullback in Q2. Uh, so we're, we're, we're likely to be down this you know, we read what everybody else on Wall Street is is, is saying in, in, in terms of what their forecasts are. Uh, they range from being down 20% down to 40 and 50% for Q2. We fall closer to the middle of that, around 27 to 30% in uh, Q2. And then um, we're likely to be much less negative and or much less lower uh, in the third and or fourth quarter. Uh, a lot of this is going to depend on what that future state of and phasing of folks getting back to some sort of normal work environment and, and the economy opening back up. Uh, we have started to, um, uh, excuse me, let me add one more point there. So when you look at this from a year over year perspective, because this is quarter to quarter, which you see on your page, uh, on a year over year perspective, we're likely compared to last year to see a four to 6% decline in GDP. We are looking out at those worst case scenarios um, and we've assigned sort of a probability of those roughly a 5%, but we are monitoring those sort of type of situations, but we don't think those are very likely. We think there's going to be somewhere between a 4% pullback in US GDP this year uh, from a year over year perspective. And then in 2021, uh, we've already started to look out to that, and that's actually where most analysts from a stock perspective are starting to forecast uh, their expectations. We'll see a positive anywhere from a positive one to sort of four percent. Um, the uh, I think in interest of time, I will skip a lot of this. Uh, but what I want to end on is sort of our portfolio action and what we've been taking. So what 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 we've set out to do, and, and we have our what we call our crisis playbook. Uh, we've set out to reduce risk for clients. Uh, and that's really happened over about the last month or so for, for our clients. We did that in part by adding cash. We sold some cyclical names. So think companies and stocks uh, that are uh, very sensitive to economic conditions and economic activity. We sold a lot of, um, not a lot, but we sold some of our energy exposure, uh, so to speak. We didn't have a ton coming into this year. Um, and, and we wanted to become even more defensive than we were coming into this year. We have increased on the fixed income side um, over the last few weeks and or month. We, we increased our, our, our quality. Now, what's going on in the fixed income market could be a whole other hour conversation. Uh, but because of some of the actions that the Fed has taken, uh, we're, we're, we're actually finding opportunities within investment grade credit within investment grade bonds and and the feds really stepped in here and and is going to start buying securities there and you've really seen a lot of issuance come to market which is a good thing because uh, you're, you're you're finding lenders of of capital to these companies um, but there's some good opportunities there for uh, us to start taking advantage of and, and start looking at on the fixed income side. With respect to the equity side, which is in a large part where we pulled that 20 to 30 percent cash, uh, um, cash exposure from, uh, we are taking our time. Uh, so, we, so we've become more defensive on our, in our equity holdings, and we're taking our time because of two reasons. One, we're likely to see increased volatility. We're likely to see some form of a pullback. And so we're, we're, we're likely to think we're going to get additional entry points here uh, to invest back in the equity equations uh, or the equity side or the equity equation of clients um, allocations. The, the other side is we're, we're likely to see a lot of really negative um, headline news and or earnings over the next few quarters because what, what a lot of companies are doing is any sort of write-off that they can add this year is they're sort of just throwing everything away and so investors from a psychological standpoint are likely to pay attention to that are likely to see that and so that's part of this thesis that that, that we're going to see continued 
uh, and or some level of pullback from current valuations of where we are. And so for us, um, we're going to take our time on the risk asset, so the equity side of the equation, and start investing in sort of our uh, credit facilities and or bond side of the equation to take opportunities of, of uh, where the market is, is sort of dictating to us currently. All right, so I will stop there uh, and open it up for any questions. Uh, John and Daniel, please feel free to add anything from your perspective. If I'm too far over in time, uh, we're, we're, we're happy to follow up with any of the questions uh, that the folks on the call have, and uh, we can answer those individually. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Okay, we got a couple questions come in. Uh, where do you think interest rates are going from here? Uh, that is a fantastic question. Um, and what we feel is interest rates in the uh, near term are likely to stay at similar levels uh, and or potentially come down on the shorter end of the curve. Uh, you typically in these types of situations see a flight to quality um, and that would cause the short end of the curve to actually increase. We just haven't seen that in some of the mechanisms, uh, you know, generally speaking, that the, that the Fed and has, has started to provide have made it more attractive to invest in the corporate space and or some of the other facilities. And, and so we just haven't seen the level of uh, the level at this moment to us of a reason and or a rationale to think uh, any part of the curve at this moment is, is going to have uh, a shock upwards, right? Where, in, where interest rates are going to rise. Um, if you're a betting person over the next, you know, five, 10, 15 years, even though people have been saying this for the last five or 10 years, uh, we are closer to a bottoming process in interest rates uh, it is likely that over the next five or 10 years, interest rates will be up from their current levels, um, but we're not forecasting that far into the future at the moment uh, with, with respect to a broad level of interest rates. We feel that they will uh, likely stay roughly where they are currently. Great answer. Next question, should there be a second wave because of lack of testing from a financial standpoint, how is that going to affect the markets? Can we recover? And then how long would that take? Um, great question. So if, if, we're half, if, if we have a second wave uh, and we don't have adequate testing, then yes, we would revisit uh, lows. We would revisit an additional pullback from you know, financial market perspective. Um, that's, in a general sense, that's likely to happen in isolated areas, meaning, you know, states that are rushing to get back and have less controls and less measures in place are likely to see an increase in cases. Now, if the healthcare system in each of those cities or states or municipalities doesn't get overrun, then an increase in people testing positive but recovering uh, is likely to be more noise. Um, but if it starts to overrun the healthcare system in those areas, that's when it becomes a greater concern. And then you have to clamp back down and have these strong, strict social distancing measures put, put back in place. And, and let me piggyback on that one, uh, Jonathan, because I think it's a good way to kind of uh, explain what Rockdale does. The, the question uh, implies that uh, the market's going to do what it does and it's probably going to go down. But I'd like for you to highlight what Rockdale did on average, because everything is customized, and we, we like that 100%. They're not in sleeves or files or pick your portfolio. No, that's not what we're doing anymore. That's so 1980. Uh, so, you know, what Rockdale did in 2008 on average in terms of how portfolios uh, were oriented with cash at the beginning of the year and how they that the portfolio changed at the end of the year. Which, and, of course, we're trying to say to you that there's some better systems, and we think this is one of them because let the market go wherever you want to, to heck. And uh, as I say, if your portfolio is pr for the most part pretty sound, you don't have to go there with the market. So describe what happened in 08, please. Yeah, that's a great uh, point, John. And when you think in relation to 2008, 
obviously the circumstances of the uh, recession and or uh, what what was happening around the world were different, right? There 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 was a situation facing us at at that time that the sort of global financial system was going to crash. Uh, I was at a different firm at that time, and I and I remember coming in one day and the uh, our chief economist at the firm uh, sat right near where where I was sitting, and he was white as a ghost and. He said, you know, I think this firm is our firm is actually going to go under. And this was the Friday before all of the banking folks got together with the Fed and said that we're going to save the economy. And, you know, we're going to start buying all these assets and pump all this money in at the time, which was on which was unprecedented levels. I'm, I'm phrasing it in that way because over sort of the 08, 09 period when our recession indicators at City National Rockdale started to increase we took action at that time to raise cash from the equity side of our client portfolios, similar to what we have done here. Now, we didn't jump into you know, 70 or 80% in cash. What we did is we started with 20 or 30%. And as the economy told us, you need to raise more cash because there's more bad news on the horizon. And our recession indicators were increasing in terms of us being in a recession and or likely continued recession we continued to raise cash for our clients. So when we got to the lows in sort of March of 09, our recession indicator had peaked. And at that time, roughly around that time and shortly after, by the middle of that summer again, we, were, we had been at a height across all of our client portfolios at 60% in cash, right? So if you had, 70% in equity securities, 60% of that 70% was invested in cash. And by the summer of 09, June, July of 09, we, we were back almost fully invested for all of our clients. We had about a 5 to 15% average in terms of cash at that point. So we had dramatically reduced. We had listened to what the economy and what our view of the economy and our indicators were telling us was likely to uh, happen over the next three and six months. And, and again, so from our perspective, that's why it's important to have a flexible asset allocation approach. We keep in mind, we absolutely, from a portfolio management perspective, keep in mind your long-term risk and needs and goals when we make those decisions and or your individual circumstances. Uh, but we do feel it's prudent and, and important to listen to what the economy is, is telling us at any given time and take portfolio action accordingly. Excellent. How do you, how do you think, how do you feel that the oil price, the cost per barrel will affect markets going forward? Uh, that is an interesting question. Um, it, it's, uh, it, you know, oil trades largely on supply and demand. Um, and if we continue to have, uh, you know, governments and or the, the production of, of uh, oil not being slowed down, uh, the, there's a huge offset from, um, from, from the demand side. And that's likely to continue until uh, certain countries, certain folks within OPEC uh, decide to stop producing and or uh, uh, reduce the amount of supply that they're pulling into the market. That's why you're seeing these negative uh, future values on, on oil. Uh, part of it's a, it's a technical thing associated with ETFs and, and or some, some indices. Part of it is uh, there's so much oil in terms of supply that folks are actually paying people to hold it for them uh, at the current moment, which again is sort of an unprecedented thing. And we think in, in the U.S., because we are somewhat oil independent and or energy independent, uh, we, we have helped sort of isolate and or reduce the huge exposure within the U.S. from, from a dependency standpoint. Um, oil being at historic lows is an indicator and a slowdown of and or a lack of economic activity. But having lower oil cost in, in general is supportive for a lot of industries. Now, energy in and of itself, a lot of um, a lot of companies can't operate profitable businesses at negative prices of oil and or you know even down to five, ten, fifteen, twenty dollars a, a barrel. You'll see a lot of projects 
come offline. You'll see a lot of businesses, uh, you know, uh, suffer uh, in in the near term. But if we can start to get folks back to work, if we start to, even if it's next year, get a uh, definable treatment and or move greatly at some point next year to a vaccination, um, and, and there's a lot of great work being done on both of those fronts, uh, the, the temporary slowdown will hopefully come back offline. Uh, it is something to continue monitoring. Um, you know, part of that answer depend, is dependent on how long that uh, um, sort of depression and, and, and oil prices continues. And, and if there's a disconnect based off of economic activity from, from a supply and demand perspective. So let me uh, jump in here too, because I was asked to address that question on a program and I had to do a little homework. And frankly, I was actually surprised that there was, I couldn't find a direct correlation between stock prices and oil prices. I, I thought there was, but I can't find a direct correlation. There are two significant factors that do make up the equation though. First is sentiment, the second is tangible economic impact. So uh, when investors see a new a low oil price, they know that it's not good sign for the economy. Uh, so it's in this way that, that oil prices can have a sentiment effect. Uh, cheap oil can lead to a negative sentiment spiral, right? Expectations. So when investors are giving, are, are giving the price of oil a close look, they, it often is appropriate because it, it provides a fuller picture of what's happening in the global economy. So no direct correlation, but in terms of sentiment, uh, you know, and, and in terms of uh, uh, people's collective thinking, it does give folks kind of a perspective or maybe even read into it an expectation of how things are going or not going so well. And it just becomes part of the consciousness, if you will, relative to consumers uh, perspective and, and expectations. Very interesting. Okay, guys, in the interest of time, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you so much. Well, thank you folks for joining us. Thank you so much, Jonathan Taylor, for, for being here and giving you your perspective. We really like uh, working with you and uh, glad you came over from the other side <laughs> uh, to the dark side, the independent side. That's what we used to say 30 years ago. That was before your time, but I remember it well. Uh, and we're going to continue doing these things. We'll post uh, like who we have lined up. It'll be a similar format. We'll t I'll talk first about what I'm seeing and you know help people see that you don't need to take it. You don't pass it. Uh, active management trumps passive investing. I, I coined that one. I think it's appropriate. Uh, so we think that's an advantage in the additional diversification. And with that, I will say good health and good wealth to you.